kids. Happy would someone just stretch out a, a hand to them and bless them as they go, please. Bearing all my 
thank you for this time and this space and we just ask if anyone heard from heaven this morning maybe you seen an image or you felt that God put a word in your heart just ask you to come forward and share it with your brothers and sisters and just as we were uh, singing that last chorus there the, the dawning of heaven crucified it just hit me you know Imagine, I can't imagine my my son, you know, sending my son to die, you know. I just can't, I can't imagine that, doing that. And I just, for, for a glimpse, I just got a glimpse of, you know, God sent his son. His darling, his part of himself, he sent it for us. And it just touched my heart. I mean, what? Just, wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. just reminded today you know the Lord has been showing me over the past weeks about God's love and about what he done for me and for all of us on the cross like we complain and we murmur and moan about different things very trivial things but sometimes we don't look to the cross and see what God has done for us. He gave everything, his whole life's blood. He bled to death. He died. He was pierced. He was beaten. He was spat upon. He done all that for us so that we would have life with him in heaven, in charity. And I thank the Lord today that we have the cross, that we can look to the cross and we can remember all that he done for us, the price that he paid. And you know, as I said before, if it was only just one person, he would do the same thing. He would still have gone to the cross. And you know, on Friday, I was coming home from uh, Nowton with my daughter. We went up to Dublin Zoo f to get out for a while and we were driving along and I seen this big moon in the sky. Now to me the moon was red, but it could have been just orange, but it looked red to me. And I said to my daughter, I said, isn't it amazing, you know, like what God can do. And then after a while we were still driving and I seen an image of two crosses. But I don't really understand the crosses were red and I seen it very plain in, in, in the distance. Whether it was this, the, the sun shining, I don't know, but it was two images of crosses. So, you know, the Lord has shown me and he's shown us all that this time is all about him because he was the one that came for us all and he wants us all to follow him and to give up what's troubling us and what's worrying us, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled, for I have overcome the world. And that's what he has done, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with you again this morning. And um, just, uh, just was just thinking myself, just in relation just to that last song, high and lifted up the darling of heaven crucified and you know it's all about Jesus you know we gather here not just to fill in time but we gather here unto him and you know as, that, as we were singing that song I was reminded just um, of the story of a woman by the name of Catherine Coleman I don't know how many of you heard of Catherine Coleman is it on 
have to turn this on. Okay. I thought I had. Okay. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. Is it on? Am I wired for sound? <laughs> okay. Yes, so, so um, <clears throat> Catherine Kuhlman. And Catherine Kuhlman probably in the, the last century would have had one of the most amazing healing ministries. I mean, people would come into those meetings and they would just be, many a times they, they were coming in, you know, almost like carried by, by their friends and maybe not even desiring to be there, but they'd come in and they'd be overwhelmed just by the, the amazing presence of God. And God would touch them and heal them. And she was asked once, you know, about, you know, what is it about your meetings? And people would go in those meetings and they would come out and it wouldn't be about Catherine Kuhlman. What would be on their lips would be Jesus. How great Jesus, what Jesus had done for them, the presence of the Lord. And she said this, she said, her prayer was always, she would pray a prayer. She said, Holy Spirit, will you glorify Jesus through me? Holy Spirit, come and glorify Jesus through me. And the, the words in that song, high and lifted up, that's what the Holy Spirit does. When we gather together in his name, the Spirit of God, the presence of God, comes through song, through human vessels to glorify Jesus. And so that, you know, you see, it's not about the preacher. It's not about the musician. It's not about us. It's always about him. He is central. And today, again, I want to remind us that, you know, the Bible says where two or three gather in his name, he's in the midst. And that's whether we're here physically or even virtually uh, on the Internet. The fact is, is that Christ is with us. He is present. Amen. And uh, with that, I want us just to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 5. And uh, we're going to read uh, verses 17 to 26. But before we do that, I just want to pray. So, Father God, I just thank you, Lord my God, for your presence, for your person. You're alive. You've gone to that cross. You've risen from the dead. You are high and lifted up. And, Lord, you are here, Lord, amongst us, with us, O oh God, by the Spirit of God. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that as we read your word, as we listen to what you've got to say, that you'll speak to us, that you'll minister. And, Lord, my God, that, Lord, our encounter, our time, will all be all centered about you. And, Lord, you will touch us. You will speak to us, O oh God, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, On one of those days he was teaching. Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who'd come from every village of Galilee and Judah and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. The power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing a, a, on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him and lay him before Jesus. Verse 19, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, and when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he'd been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we've seen extraordinary things today. Hallelujah. Now, I believe as God meets us today, Anything is possible. 
We can go home today seeing and experiencing extraordinary things. And so I would just challenge you right as we start this message just to be expectant for God to do something. Be expectant for breakthrough. Be expectant for him to, to touch you. Don't just come and this is not just, you know, going, you're not just filling in time. Let this be a day of, of encounter with Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. So tonight, today, I want to I just look at the, 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 the theme, if you like, of ripping off roofs and breaking through ceilings. Amen? That's, uh, we're going to be reckless today. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, as we look at the background here, we see just this is the early part of Jesus' ministry. Uh, at this point in time, he hadn't really encountered the, the rancor uh, and religious resistance that was about to follow. However, it's like the religious people of the day were beginning to grow a little bit suspicious about the carpenter from Nazareth. And just their, uh, their annoyance with him, their curiosity was beginning to mount. But this is still probably what you term the, the honeymoon stage of his ministry. But what was about to happen, the healing of this paralyzed man, was going to prove a turning point in terms of his, his relationship with the religious. Up until this time, as I said, he, was, uh, he hadn't stirred the pot too much. Uh, he'd been in some ways playing by the rule book. But something was about to happen that would cause him to depart from the, the regular script. Something was about to rattle the cage of the religious. And, uh, you know, today, let's pray that we're not religious pray that we're not, you know, the word religion, the word religion means to bind up, okay? Religion is the biggest enemy to the gospel. You know, we're not religious. We're in a living relationship with a living God who is alive, who heals, who redeems, who gives hope. That's who we serve. That's, that's who God wants us to encounter this morning. Praise his name. And so, you know, we're in winter in Capernaum. And Jesus had been staying at Peter's house, which was a, a big house with a, uh, a, 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 a large flat roof on it. And what we're told there is, is that, you know, Jesus was in town, and now all the religious leaders from far and wide were sort of gravitating to Peter's house, like bees uh, to a pot of honey. And, but they weren't necessarily coming to hear what he had to say. They were coming to check him out. Now, sometimes you'll get people that want to check you out. They want to put their spiritual dipstick in and just see what's, what's there. And uh, I always remember we did a, uh, some years ago, we did a, um, it was called a March for Jesus. Uh, and Christians from all over the country came to, converged on Dublin. And uh, I remember I, I was part of that. I wanted to march for Jesus. I wanted to be seen as somebody who loved Jesus and make a statement, if you like, for, his, for him. And anyhow, in the middle of that march, somebody saddled up behind me or beside me. And he started asking me, he says, now, you know, what's your doctrine? What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about this? And, you know, I thought, you, you strange fellow. <laughs> you religious fellow. He didn't want to know who I was. He didn't know what... And basically, I just had to tell him, listen, you know, I love Jesus. I've been saved by Jesus. He's the, the, the center of my life, the source of my life. He's the one who, why I wake up in the morning. You know, so, you know, we'll get people like that who in a sense, they're interested just in checking out, just to see if you're correct in your doctrine, correct in your behavior, correct. They're not interested in meeting Jesus who's in you. Okay? Praise his name. But what we see here in this meeting that was in Peter's house, there was something different about this meeting. This wasn't the synagogue. This was not their turf. This was meeting Jesus on his terms. And you know something? 
we will come to Jesus on his terms, not on our terms. Some people, you know, there's like, you know, they, they, they present, you know, well, I'll serve God if, you know, these criteria are satisfied. I'll worship God, you know, only in, you know, a, a building. I'll do it this way. But God, that's not who God is. God is God the Lord. Amen. We come to him on his terms. And what we find about this particular meeting, there's a phrase there. It says, the power of the Lord was there to heal the sick. The presence of the Lord was there to heal the sick. Now that's a very telling statement. There's a, a purpose behind the meeting. This wasn't just a haphazard, indiscriminate meeting. This was a meeting where God had divinely inspired and designated that this would be a day where healing would take place. And who knows, if you're needing healing this morning, be it spiritual healing, be it physical healing, be it uh, emotional healing, God's power, his presence is here to heal the sick. Whatever you need this morning, Christ is more than able to minister. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's eternal. So you come with a need, you've come to the right place. And we just need to plug in to his presence this morning. Hallelujah. You see, what we see in that is that there's a difference between the general presence of God the omnipresence of God and what's known as the manifested presence of God. Now, the manifested presence of God is like God's presence up close and personal. It's like God's presence in your face. You feel his breath. You feel his touch. And there are times where, you know, we'll be in a meeting and this is just the general presence of God. But then the manifested presence of God comes and you sense his touch. You hear his word. God does something. There's an encounter. And usually that's the time that God is shifting. God is moving. There's the breakthrough. There's the healing. There's what you need. Hallelujah. So here we see the presence of the Lord was there to heal the sick. It was the manifested presence of God. There was a special assignment, anointing to heal. You see, friends, in the scripture, the Bible talks about a word called kairos in the original language. There's two words for time in the original language. One is chronos, and the other is kairos. Chronos is chronology. It's like the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, 2021, 2022, you know, it's just the general chronological time. But then there's another word called kairos. And kairos speaks of opportunity. It's a significant time. It's a time where God is going to do business. It's an opportunity where his manifested presence comes he touches you. He speaks to you. He does something for you. He reveals something of himself to you. He opens up the kingdom to you. And you're never the same again. Hallelujah. And you see, so often people come and they'll come into a, a meeting with a, a Kronos mentality. This is Sunday. We normally come to church on Sunday. This is our routine. That's chronology. But what I'm challenging you, if you come with that mentality and you stay there, you'll miss the kairos. You'll miss those times where God speaks to you. And when he speaks to you, there's purpose behind it. Genesis 28 is one of my favorite passages. It's the story of Jacob. Jacob's on the run. He goes to sleep. 
uh, and he gets a, a vision of heaven, the ladder with the angels ascending and descending. And when he wakes up, he says these words. He said, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place, but I did not recognize it. I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Hallelujah. You see, friends, the presence of the Lord is here this morning by virtue of the fact that two or three are gathered in his name. But I tell you, there are divine assignments God has. There are kairos moments that God wants to bring you into. In Jacob's case, he recognized a portal, a door that led into heaven. Hallelujah. Here, the presence of the Lord was there to heal. There was a portal of healing. There was a door into healing that if you step through, you move from infirmity to wholeness. Hallelujah. And this morning, for you, there's a portal. There's a door. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door that leads to life. For some of you, it's a doorway into hope. A doorway from depression into wholeness. From sickness into healing. Praise his name. And again, you ought to understand that when the presence of God comes, it's not willy-nilly. As I said, it's kairos. There's a, an opportunity. There's a significance. There's a point. And it's always an invitation. When you sense God's presence, you need to ask the question, God, what do you want me to do? What's this about? And what it's about is there's a door. There's something he wants to show you. There's something he wants to do in you. It's not just so you get goosebumps on goosebumps, amen? It's important to recognize those, those, those moments. So many times I find Christians are, it's like they're in this, this daze. God's speaking to them. Neon lights often. God's trying to get through to you. You're loved. You're loved of God. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're delivered. You're set free. Walk through the door. When that presence comes, it's an invitation. It's a kairos moment not to be mistaken or just glossed over. Hallelujah. And in this situation, this Kairos moment, this was a Kairos moment for Jesus. As I said, it marked a change, a shift in his relationship with the religious. Now he's, they're, from this moment on, they're, they're, they're out to, to, to do him in. It's a, a Kairos moment for the paralyzed man. This man's about to get healed. It's a, and it's a Kairos moment for his four friends. And when his four friends arrive, of course, they find that they can't get in. They keep on knocking, but they can't get in. See, outside of the house, this house was filled with all the religious people of the day, but the real needs were outside the house. And I'd say this morning, you know, not that these people are religious, please. I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to offend you that way. <laughs> You're not. But, you know, friends, outside this house, outside this building this morning, there are people that have a need of Jesus. They have a need of hope. Someone to share good news with them in the midst of just doom and gloom. Outside the house, there's the real needs. And you see, the walls of that Peter's house could not limit God's ability to see and to hear the needs. Isaiah 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so shortened that he cannot save. His ear isn't dull or deaf that he cannot hear. Because outside the house, there was a man who was paralyzed, being brought by four friends in the hope of healing. But as it to their disappointment, there was no access. I don't know if you've ever made a plan to go somewhere and you arrive and, you know, 
Like you go arrive at a restaurant and it's it's all booked out, uh, or you go want to go to a concert and uh, it's all the tickets have gone. See, there was a, a physical obstacle to this man reaching Jesus just by the fact of the, the sheer volume of people inside the house. There was a a religious obstacle. The fact that it was packed with religious people who weren't there, as I said, to receive Jesus. They were there to check him out. And religion, as it is often the biggest hindrances to the gospel. It could be religious expectations, religious expression, religious looks, sometimes religious language. I so remember we had a guy once in, in our church in, in Dublin, and I used to hate it because if he was ever on the door, I would try and get him away from the door. I remember one day, you know, there was some new visitors arrived in the, in the door, and he reached out his hand and he said, Praise the Lord, thou art welcome in this place. <laughs> now, <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, thou art welcome in this place. He said with a shake in his voice. And, you know, I, I mean, for me, that was just cringeworthy. And I was thinking, get that religious fellow out of the way because he's a hindrance to normal people who want to want to come to experience something fresh. So we've got to, is it religious language, religious, religious expressions can sometimes be a hindrance to normal people who... Really, all they want is Jesus, okay? But in this situation, you know, this, the response from the four friends is, is noteworthy. You know, this would have been normally enough just to put them off, but not these guys. And what they did is, is they first they, they exhibited extraordinary compassion. See, these guys were genuinely, sincerely, they, ge they genuinely, sincerely cared and loved their friend. They were compassionate towards him. Now, compassion defined as this. It's a deep awareness of another's suffering coupled with a desire or wish to relieve it. Amen? So compassion was one of the characteristics of these friends. And so, you know, uh, you know we see examples of that. There's Joseph who was compassionate towards his brothers who had wronged him. The Samaritan when he saw the man's need, he was filled with compassion. We see the prodigal, when the prodigal was coming back, was filled with compassion. He ran out, he embraced him, he kissed him. He did the very opposite that he should have done. We read in, in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the attribute of God, because of God's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do you know something this morning? There's a fresh compassion for you. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, God's compassion, they're new and fresh every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Every day you wake up, there's an opportunity to experience that compassion of the Lord. And of course, we see Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 9, says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved by compassion because they fainted. They were scattered abroad like sheep having no shepherd. You know, outside the building this morning, there are lost people. There are people who are you know, like sheep without a shepherd. No direction going into situations, circumstances, and relationships that are destructive and harmful to them. There's a, a, a little thing here about the pit, okay, something very pertinent to Joshua. It says a man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. There was a Christian scientist who came along and said, you only think that you're in a pit. A Pharisee came and said, only bad people fall into a pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve the pit. The tax man said, are you paying tax on the pit? A word of faith guy comes and he says, just confess that you're not in a pit. The opposite said, well, optimist says, well, it could be worse. The pessimist said, it will get worse. 
But Jesus, when he sees him, took him by the hand and he lifts him out of the pit. See, that's compassion. Compassion feels, puts yourself in somebody else's shoes, but it actually does something to help. Amen? It lifts, praise God. And the Holy Spirit comes into our pit, into our lives. He comes to lift us. He comes to lift Jesus as the, the, the author, finisher, the source of our help this morning. Praise God. So these four guys, they were compassionate, but they were also creative. They came up with an imaginative strategy. And of course, you know, God himself is a God of endless, boundless creativity. And I was talking to Charlie earlier this week, and he was saying he was doing a course in uh, in woodworking, and he's just in really enjoying it. So Charlie, if you're listening, I'm talking about you. Uh, he was just enjoying it. And I just said to him, I said, you know something? You know, there's different anointings. There's an anointing to, uh, to worship, but often God will anoint you in your business, in what you do with your hands. And I was just reading here uh, is, uh, Exodus 3, and this man called uh, Bezael, Bezael, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the, tri- of the tribe of Judah. He says, Verse 3 says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability, intelligence, with knowledge and craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and carving wood to work at every craft. Hallelujah. So God is a God who's multifaceted. He's creative. He gives you dreams and visions. Amen. It's not just, you know, in the religious sense. God can bless the work of your hands. He can make you the very best wallpaper hanger or painter or woodworker or whatever, whatever you put, baker, whatever you put your hands to it, God will give you the edge on what you're doing. Amen? Hallelujah. Remind me just of a, a man, a book I once read called The Mover of Mountains and the Mover of Men. It's by a guy called... R.J. Letourneau. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Letourneau. But uh, Letourneau, even today, is there's a, a, a university that he established. But he was a godly man. And God would give him dreams. And those dreams were often in relation to uh, earth-moving ma- 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 uh, machinery. So God would give him, download the, s- the specifics, designs, of all the earth-moving machinery. Most of those were like revolutionary. Many times he would go to the engineers to get his plans drawn up, and they said, it's impossible, impossible. And he says, no, no, you've got to go ahead and do it. And of course, what ended up happening was, I think 70% of earth-moving equipment today in engineering uh, was actually his idea that he got directly from God through a dream. He had, and by the time he finished his life, he had 300 different patents. So God has got a creativity. Here's an obstacle that they couldn't get past. So what do you do? What do you do when you hit a, a wall? You go to God. God gives you an idea. God gives you something creative. When you, somebody says you can't do that, amen, that's a time to stop and think, God, what is the way around this? What is a creative idea in order to get this done? Amen. Hallelujah. So they were uh, c- uh, compassionate. They were creative. And now we see they were courageous and committed. And so what did they decide to do? They decided, well, I know what we'll do. We'll climb up on the roof and we'll pull the, the tiles apart. Now, this was risky, radical to rip off the ceiling, the roof, the, uh, the tiles off the ceiling, the crash through a ceiling. I mean, you know, imagine if that was your home. How would you feel if somebody was suddenly on your roof and uh, ripping off the, the tiles off your roof and that sort of thing? You know, they were willing to weather the storm of the critic and the cynic alike. And remind me just of a, a book I once read called All In by Mark Batterson. And uh, he says there, and, and, and just quoting from, he says, last century, 
a brave band of souls became known as the one-way missionaries. One-way missionaries. And what they would do is they would purchase one-way tickets to the mission field with no return half. Instead of suitcases, they packed all their earthly belongings into coffins. It says of A. W. Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail for the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that the headhunters who had lived there, who lived there, had martyred every missionary before him. Mill did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. He packed his coffin. For 35 years, he lived amongst the tribe and loved them. He died, when he died, the tribe member buried him in the middle of the village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. That's a powerful epitaph to leave in terms of a legacy, isn't it? It goes on to say, when did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places and do easy things? Amen? Sometimes the challenge is going to be difficult. Sometimes there's going to be obstacles in the way. But if God has called you to do it, you've got to be compassionate, you've got to be creative, but you've also got to be courageous and committed. Hallelujah. So that today, what roof is God calling you to break through? What ceiling is he calling you to break through? Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle for second best when God's promises life and that abundantly. Don't settle. In order that Christ's life can touch you, amen? What lengths would you go? What sacrifice? What time? What talent are you willing to give? What tithe? Are you willing to partake? Hallelujah. Compassion, creative, committed and courageous. And then the final one is cooperative. Amen. You see, the, this particular healing was not a one-man band. It wasn't an independent Lone Ranger or Tonto. This was a co cooperative effort. You know, these guys were bound by compassion. They were bound by their creativity, by their courage and their commitment. And they, I'll just put down here, is they, have jo they were joined in the fellowship of the mat. The fellowship of the mat. The mat that carried the paralytic. Four corners to that mat. One friend on each corner. Each was essential to the completion of the task. They had to move forward together. That's the message and title of my, me my message this morning. And you see, friends, the work of God is not independent. We are now in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God used individuals and used them often independently. But in the New Testament, we're a body. We're a body. We're a family. And each Part of that body is essential to fulfill the purposes of God. Hallelujah. See, one of the biggest problems today is independence. We live in a highly independent world. I want to do it my way. I want to do it this way. And the idea of cooperation is sometimes the last thought on the agenda. And yet the scripture is full of exhortations. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. So for the body does not consist of one member, but many. The foot sh if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of uh, where, where would be the sense of smell? But as, it's, as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, we are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor can again the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body which seem weaker are indispensable. And other parts of the body we think are less honorable, we bestow greater honor. 
Our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which of our more presentable parts do you, do not require? But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that, that, la- that lacked it, and that there may, be, may no, be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Can you imagine if one of these guys decided holding one of the corners of the bed? I don't feel like holding up my end. (laughs) I don't feel like fulfilling my commitment. I'm not sure that I actually have the compassion that I I once had for my friend. I'm going to go home. Suddenly, it's like, (laughs) you know, and if two do it, (laughs) the man's going to fall off the bed. See, it took four. It took more than one. The kingdom takes more than one. Okay? I play my part. Liam plays his part. Mary plays her part. Simon plays his part. We all play our part. There's things that you can do that I can't do. And there's things that I can do that you can't do. We all need to take our corner of the bed, amen, in order to see the work done, amen. Hallelujah. You see, that's our biggest problems, you know. I see, I was just thinking earlier on, you know, one of the biggest issues for the church today are in, even within the fivefold ministry. We have evangelists that don't know how to work as part of a body. They want to work independently. They don't want to be part of a church. They don't want to be part of, they, they can't get on with the pastor. What pastors that can't get on with evangelists, evangelists can't get on with, uh, with pastors, prophets that can't get on with apostles, apostles that can't get on with, with prophets, teachers are somewhere stuck in the middle. Uh, and yet... Yet, they're part of a body. And what we've got to recognize, we need each other. Okay? Independence is our biggest enemy. Hallelujah. So Jesus, when he sees the friends, it says there in verse 20, Jesus saw their faith. In this situation, it wasn't the faith of the paralyzed man. It was the faith of the four friends. And there are times where God sees your faith on behalf of a a friend. He sees your faith when you pray. He sees your faith when you're interceding. Amen. The paralytic was strangely silent. Jesus comes in and he, first thing he does, he forgives the man's sin. Okay, and that's what sits the cat amongst the pigeons in relation to the religious. He heals the man's soul before he heals the body. Religious uh, ca- cages are rattled and they go, sends them into a frenzy. And Jesus says to them, and he says, you know, what is easier, to forgive a man's sin or to say, pick up your bed and walk? Hallelujah. You know, Jesus, so it said that the words of Christ were punctuated by works. Jesus would preach the word. He would send the word. And when he sent the word, he would often expect the person to act, be activate that word. So he tells this man, he tells the man of the pool of Bethesda as well, the same words, pick up your bed and walk. So when you hear the word, there's a response. Some people think, you know, well, God does zap me. Wave the magic wand. No, 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 no. Sometimes God's word to you is a challenge. Pick up your bed and walk. There's a challenge to you today. Pick up your corner of the bed, your corner of the mat, your assignment before God. Amen. Now you can let that go. Or you can respond to what God's word is speaking. Amen. 
And we can see God doing some marvelous things. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's just pray. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you that, Lord, you're up to something, oh God, here in Joshua. You're up to something, Lord, here in this nation. And, Lord, my God, I thank you, Lord, that you give us opportunities, oh God, to step through, through portals, Lord, into the purposes of your kingdom. In these last days, oh God, Lord, my God, you're going to cause your people to recognize when the presence of the Lord is there to heal, when the presence of the Lord is there to save, when the presence of the Lord is there to worship, to do what you want them to do. And I pray, Lord, that your people, Lord, will be willing on the day of your visitation, that they will be willing to walk through, Lord, in faith, in compassion, creatively, Lord, Lord, with courage and commitment. And Lord, together, 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 Lord, pushing back, Lord, the gates of darkness, oh God. Together being the church that you are going to come back for, a bride that is glorious. We bless you and thank you this morning. Amen. 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 Communion. Praise God. Praise God. We're just going to prepare our hearts just to come around the table of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'll just ask uh, Jenny, Kenny just to come up. Praise God. Amen. Maybe we can just sing that song, Thank You for the Cross. Praise God. Let's prepare our hearts. You know, as we come to the cross, one of the, the things about the cross is the cross is a place of decision. And I'm praying that this morning the words we've preached will have resonated with you. That, as I said, they haven't just been words. But there's the Spirit of God behind those words. There's a conviction of God's Spirit behind those words. Now, as we come to the cross, as we come to uh, this passage in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, communion is always a celebration of the cross. It's a reminder of what Jesus did on the, the cross of crucifixion. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed. And we're called to remember and we're reminded of what he did. And what that means, friends, in practical terms is this. When we come around the cross, it isn't just a, a religious routine that we go through. Again, this is a kairos moment. God can heal you with one touch. He can turn your life around with one touch. He can save you. He can deliver you. And so we come to a place of decision here this morning where we exchange our life for his life. We hold on to our life, we'll lose it. We lose our life for his sake, we're going to gain eternal life. Hallelujah. So the cross is a decision point. We bring our life, we bring our will, we bring our problems, our mess before him. And we say, God, I need you. Oh God, I need you. I need you to turn this situation around. I need your help. I need your grace. Today, I'm recognizing the presence of the Lord is there to heal. The presence of the Lord is there to save. The presence of the Lord is there to give me new direction. Turn my life around. The presence of the Lord is there, is here to deliver me. I'm going to pick up my bed. I'm going to walk. Amen. Praise God.
we hold our emblems in the in our hands. I haven't got one right here. Amen. I just want to read here the words to Paul here in, in to the Corinthians. He says, "For I received from the Lord." that which was also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Why don't we just stand? And let's just partake together. Hallelujah. So, Father, the cup, Lord, and the, and, the, and the bread. Lord, we partake, Lord, in remembrance of you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for just your breakthroughs, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. Just um, if we just close up the service this morning, just a very quick reminder: the uh, Holy Spirit night this week. We've got a special uh, visiting ministry. Uh, Dermot Landy will be with us on Friday at 7:30 in, in Navin, and then the week after that, we have another couple that's coming: uh, Paul and Eula O'Higgins. Uh, some of you may know Paul and Eula. Paul was a former priest. Uh, Eula was a former nun. Uh, and they're both saved and serving God for a number of years and uh, great friends and uh, they'll be greatly blessed. So that's the next two Sundays uh, there in, in Navin. So I encourage you, make the effort to go, amen. Join the body and experience what God may want to do in your life. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Sorry, just uh, one other announcement is um, the cell groups. Um, Liam started a cell in ba in Cavan, sorry, on Wednesday. So it's every two weeks. We have a men's one here on Thursday, Thursday and the women's on <laughs> Wednesday. And we have Navin as well on Tuesday and Bally Firm will be starting in two weeks. So well. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. <laughs> um, so just to encourage everybody to join a cell if you're not already in one and anyone watching online to just connect in and join a cell group. So. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for the love, Lord. Thank you for the day of Jesus. Watch me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness.
Worthy is the Lamb.